Look with me if you would to James, James chapter 3. James chapter 3, we're going to start reading in verse number 1. In James chapter 3 and verse number 1, this is the last Sunday you're going to get to come to church this year. Sure proud to have you in the house of the Lord. Yes. And to have victory. Isn't it wonderful to have victory, Brother Messick, still, by the grace of God. Whoa. <clears throat> Here in James chapter 3, we're going to start reading in verse number 1. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, are driven of furious winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Lord, we thank you for your word this evening. We praise you for your guiding hand upon us. We ask you, Lord, that you would let your Holy Ghost just begin to spread the gospel once again over our lives. Lord, we're looking for a new year. We haven't, we're not through with this and yet, Lord, but we're asking you, give us guidance as we head out. And we're praising you for it now in the name of Jesus. We thank you. Amen and amen. In Mark chapter 6, verse 45, Jesus has looked out over the Sea of Galilee. He's just done an incredible miracle, five loaves and two fishes. He's fed 5,000 men, not counting the women and the children. And he tells his disciples to get in the boat. And here he says straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side before unto Bethsidia while he sent away the people. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when evening was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling and rowing. For the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea. And he would have passed them by. I think it's, it's in part, I want to talk to you this morning or this evening about the thought, row, R-O-W, row and leave the helm to Jesus. Amen. That's what directs the boat. Yes. We, we was reading there in uh, James about the tongue, how that it's a little member, but it controls the body, and we put the bit in the horse's mouth, and it shows control. And huge ships driven before furious winds are still guided by the helm or the rudder. Uh, we was reading, as we was reading our closing scriptures for the year Saturday, which yesterday morning, Connie was reading to us there out of uh, Acts chapter 27, and there's 276 people aboard the ship that's caught in, in the winds of Eurachlodon. And when they, they're sounding to see where they're going, and out in the middle of the ocean, they run up on this island. They haven't got there yet, but they can tell it, it was 60 fathoms, and now it's 30, and now it's 20. And so instead of running the ship aground in the night, they, they uh, pulled all the sails down and four and throwed out four anchors out of the stern. That's the back end from what I understand. Trying just to hold there and see if in the morning they could find a place. The, the ship is almost capsized for those 14 days anyway, but now they're, they're just hoping that somehow they're going to be saved. And Paul told them if they'd stay on the ship that they had a good chance of making it. But they wake up the next morning and uh, they look and there is an opening there. They see where a creek comes off of the island into the ocean. And so they thought if we could run it there, that might, that might be a place that we could still survive the wreck when we get there. Because the, the, the storm was so great, the vessel was just knocking it around like a toy in those huge waves. And so they lifted the mainsail 
And the Bible says they loosed the rudder. And evidently that was one that, you know, they had the big wheel that they got it with and it was by ropes, the, the, the rudder was, and they steered the thing as good as they could during the storm. And I mean, they shot it right into the, as close as they could get. But they didn't make it, they didn't make it to land, but they did run the ship aground. The, the storm was so great, it tore the hinder part of the ship off, but the fore part stuck and the people was saved. But that, that, that I could, I don't know why that captured my mind. They loosed the rudder. I, I want to tell you something. We need to, that's what I thought about us, man, that we don't know what kind of storms in front of us, but what we need to do is turn loose of the guiding system. Like, like brother Messick is talking about and, and get a hold uh, of God, get a hold of the oars, and that's working. Labor, labor in prayer, labor in the Word of God. I mean, pull your pull your weight everywhere you go, and your faithfulness to the Lord, your witnessing. But let God give the guidance. Let Him let Him do the steering for us, because He knows the way through the wilderness. And all we got to do is follow His direction. And I can see one of those boats, you know, where somebody's sitting back there at the back, and everybody else is rowing, and they're they're steering the thing right into the deal. And a helm, it could it it was that way or it could be, you know, guided from the front too. But anyway, I, I just want to put that thought in your mind. Roll and leave the helm, H-E-L-M, leave the helm to Jesus. <clears throat> What's interesting in, in this Mark chapter 6, the Bible says that he saw them doing something. He saw them toiling in rowing. They, I mean, they was with all their heart, they was trying to keep the ship from going down. And I mean, they're doing everything they can. So they're working hard and he sees that. So when he sees them working on it, trying to, trying to make it work, trying to do what he told them to do, guess what he does? He comes to them. And if they didn't need him, he would go on by. But boy, when they saw him, it scared them first and they're crying out. Of course, you know, when the Lord goes up in the ship, the, instantly the seas are calmed and well, anybody can run this thing now. <laughs> well, that's, that's where we get our trouble in. We say, well, once the storm's over, I can handle it now. Brother Messi, is it okay to go back to the way you was before? Oh, no. No, because the second trip, ain't. it's going to be a lot worse than the first one was. You Be thankful that you turn your life over to God. And I mean, I, I, I can't point no fingers. I look at my own life. If I went back where I was when Jesus found me, I mean... It, it desecrate. I'd be, I'd be ruined. But what I found in the Lord would just turn it loose, go to work, work on getting away from everything that's back yonder, and headed, headed out, and in such great joy. You never see a man get in more trouble hardly than Jonah. And the reason why is he, he, he won't turn the helm loose. The Lord says, okay, I'm going to give you direction. He's got the hold to the helm back here. He's guided it. And he said, my boat's not going that way. My boat's going to Joppa. And then I'm going to catch a ship going up to uh, Tarshish. And I'm not going to Nineveh. So he got, I mean, he's holding it with both hands. He's got his feet on it. He says, you're not turning me. Wow. All because he won't hear what God has got to say. In, in, in fact, here in Jonah chapter 1, we'll look at just a few verses of it, just kind of get a, a bite of where he's at. Chapter 1 and verse number 10, you know, he goes down from, from where he's living down to Joppa. After the Lord tells him to go to Nineveh, and he said, no, -uh, I ain't going. So he tells him who he is. He says, I'm a prophet, and the Lord sent me to, to Nineveh, but I'm headed to Tarshish. And they're like, they're scared to death. They said, you can't do God like that. How many know that that's the truth? You cannot direct God. God directs us. But our whole system is set up where we can tell God what to do. No. 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 Then were the men exceedingly afraid. Them, uh, the boy, that crew on the ship, they're scared to death when he says, God told me to, to go to Nineveh, and I told him I wasn't going. Woo! Is that going to work? No. Then were the men exceedingly afraid and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew he fled from the presence of the Lord. Friends, you know why people hang on to the back of the seat? Why they leave before the altar service comes? Why they get to the door and run back to the car? All of that is fleeing the presence of God. Men, women, boys, girls, whatever. And so we don't want to flee from the presence of the Lord. We want to run to him and say, Lord,
Lord, take a hold of this thing before I turn it over. Please help me. Get a hold of the helm in my life. I don't mind doing the work. Let me, let me roll. Let me pull at it. But give me guidance while I'm going through this storm of life. In verse number 11, <clears throat> Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. And he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So what he's saying, I'm not willing to commit suicide, but I'll tell you how you can fix the problem. Throw me overboard. So shall the sea be calm unto you, for I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. So he knows, what does he know? He knows he's out of the will of God. He knows he's trying to steer the vessel, and the Lord said, that's not going to work, buddy. That's, that's not going to work for nobody. And you know, where we're headed at into, into 2021, if ever you turn the helm loose, it's today, today to do it. I mean, get in there and say, God, whatever your direction is, that is where I am going to go. So he tells them, throw me overboard. Nevertheless the men, here they are, back to doing what? They rowed hard. You know what they're rowing against? They're rowing against the will of God. Yeah, they're trying their best. They hear what Jonah said, but they thought, man, we don't want this man's blood on our hands. So man, they're rowing with everything. They rowed hard to bring it to land, but they could not. Friends, whatever happens in your life or mine, we can never fix ourselves without God's help. We've got to have Him. We are dependent upon the Lord's understanding to get a hold of that helm and say, I can guide you out of this storm if you'll just let me get a hold of what drives the, yeah. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to land, but they could not for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. There's storms out there that we can never survive if we don't listen to God and hear what the voice of the Lord is talking to us. So we have a choice as we're facing the new world of tomorrow the choice is either row or drift. You can't handle the, the helm and row at the same time. If you don't row, you go nowhere. You're just afloat, just drifting around trying to guide yourself wherever you go. That, that old song that they sang sometimes, I don't remember drifting because pleasure rode with me. When careless winds start blowing, guess what? You drift so easily. And storms make no exceptions. And friend, I sure had mine. Yeah, I had my storm. But thank God. Thank God what? Thank God that he found me just in time. Just before his going over the edge into the eternal abyss of hell, the Lord got a hold of the helm and turned that vessel back. Some years ago, we had a family in our church. The particular man I'm talking about didn't go to our church, but his wife did and several of her sister-in-laws, two of her sister-in-laws and brother-in-law. Anyway, uh, it was around Halloween, maybe Halloween night, and uh, this boy had a 357 pistol, and he, he was a big old stout gentleman, probably, I don't know, 25 or 30, and he'd been drinking, just, just normal stuff for people that don't know Christ, you know, just doing, doing whatever you're supposed to do when you don't know Christ. And he got the gun out, and he was snapping it at his son. And man, his wife saw him, and she come in there, and she said, she said, are you crazy? He said, it's unloaded, look here. And he puts it to his head and, and clicked it again, and guess what? It blowed his brains out. He fell over on the bed. He bled plumb through the mattress and the, the thing under the mattress. And they, they didn't think nothing about him living. But because he didn't die, they gathered him up in an ambulance and rushed him to Lubbock. My 
brother-in-law was in the ER working uh, those critical cases and he said they didn't even try to fix that. They just put him on uh, oxygen and stuff and just tried to help him until he passed. There was no way he could live. But the next day he's still alive. Whenever, whenever he shot himself, they called the church. And I mean, we, of course we prayed. We were the only ones everybody heard about was praying. He had, he had uh, two or three children and uh, after a couple of days, I was able to go and be there in the hospital, and there was absolutely, and there's no sign. He just, you know, just like a vegetable with a, the, the gun was kind of like that, so it kind of blowed this side of his head, just opened that side of his head up, blowed a bunch of his brain out. He say, preacher, why are you telling such awful stories? I'm just telling you how ignorant humanity is when we don't have God as at the helm of our ship. And the family, as I, when I got to the Methodist hospital and caught the elevator up, it's not called Methodist now, what, what do they call it now? Uh, Covenant. Yeah, Covenant. Anyway, it's Methodist hospital then. Um, I stand there at the elevator, and when I caught the elevator to go up to, on the third floor where this boy's name was, his name was Howard Murphy, where he was at, uh, his family was coming down. They said, we've been in there, we've been there for two days, you know, night and day, and nothing. He just, just laying there, just, you know, just alive and breathing. And uh, that, that when, when they walked out of, the, out of the elevator, that's what they told me. So I said, well, I'm going to go up and just pray that God, that God will give it. We, we asked for a miracle, and we're still believing God. He's alive. That's a miracle by itself. And we know what he did was not intentional. And, you know, it was crazy. But who hadn't done some crazy stuff? I mean, you could ask anybody in this room, friends, we've done some crazy stuff in our lives. Isn't it time just to get back to doing what we're supposed to? Get a hold of them oars and say, God, I, I can't give direction, but help me. If I, if I can pull on the, I can keep the ship moving, if I can just do right. I will never forget this, and it's, it's almost unbelievable. And you may think I'm alive when I get through telling it, but I walked in there, and as I walked up to the, his bed, to the foot of his bed, his eyes popped open. And he looked at me, and he said, you're Danny Williams. I, I went to school with the boy. He was a couple of years older than me. But I said, yeah, I, I am. And he said, you're not going to believe what just happened to me. I said, don't have nobody. I said, tell me. He said, all this time I've been falling to hell down through this black tunnel and no way out, just falling, falling, falling. And he said, I started screaming, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And he said, just now, while I was screaming out, Jesus, 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 he said, a hand come and knock me loose from that blackness. And whenever it did, my eyes popped open, and I just now saw you. And that boy was so gloriously saved, spiritually saved, and come back here and lived. I don't know if he's still in Snyder or not. He's not 100% by no means, but he, he's alive and, and, and has lived here, lived here for several years. Like I said, I hadn't seen him in, in quite a while. But I, I'm telling the story for this reason. Nobody but God can reach in through those ether waves of darkness and hell. But that man, because people prayed, had enough consciousness in his spirit to cry out to Jesus. Friends, past the world that we know, there is a spiritual world out there. And I mean, while we're sitting here, you know, wondering if we're going to go to the altar or whatever, or what about next week, or what we're going to do in the morning, the, the, the supernatural world or the spiritual world, it's going it's going crazy trying to trying to take the church of God down. But the Lord said he's going to guide it through the storm. If we'll just turn loose of the helm and say, Lord, you guide me. You can take us past where we are by the grace of God. And so we've got the choice of either row or drift. In Psalm chapter 25 and verse number four, it says, oh, Lord, teach me thy path. Why would we need the Lord's path if we got our own? But David, he's done had some trouble. He said, nevertheless, the, look at this passage in Psalm 25 and 4. <clears throat> Shoot me thy ways, O Lord, and teach me thy paths. Woo! Don't we need to hear that? It's so easy for us to, to make presumptions and think, this is the way we're going to do it. Whatever happens. And we kind of take pride, even if we're wrong in doing it, we did it our way. But look at David. 
He's smarter than that. Shoo me thy way, Lord. Yeah, look at that next verse. It's powerful, John. That's good. Lead me in thy truth. Teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. Those men are out there rowing like crazy. They're trying to do what Jesus did. That's why Jesus goes to them. He says, go to the other side in Mark there when they're rowing and the ship is it's in, the, in the midst of the sea. Uh, his disciples are there, but there he sees them, what? Toiling and rowing. I mean, they're giving it their best. And so he says, I'm going to go help them boys. So he, he walks through. That's when they see him walking on the water. He goes to them. And basically, he straightens up whatever it's going to take to get to the other side. And they get to go on by the grace of God. Look at, look at Psalm chapter 16 and verse number 11. We're talking about we have a choice. The choice is either row or drift our direction without God's hand on us. In 16 and 11, he says, Thou wilt show me the path of where? How many likes living? Yes. <laughs> yes. Living, he loved me. Yeah. I like living. Man, I like life. Thou wilt show me the path of life in thy presence is fullness of joy and at thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. Who wants to get away from that? Does 357 answer it? If it's good, why didn't the God just say, okay, take me on down to the darkness of hell. Instead, on the inside, in an unconscious mind, is a voice screaming, Jesus, 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 until Jesus actually knows knocks him loose from the devil and he wakes up to, to give his own testimony. He went from church to church all over Snyder giving his testimony I was going to hell and Jesus stopped it. Man, what a powerful word from the Lord. On, on down in Psalm chapter 27 and verse number 11. <clears throat> Psalm chapter 27 and verse number 11. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path. Let me, let me find the road so good that I don't miss it. How many's ever been lost? <laughs> yeah, every one of them, especially the ladies. <laughs> I knew that was going to wake him up. There's not a sleeper in there. <laughs> Help me. <laughs> She's not helping me now. <laughs> well, the men have been lost. I mean, men has been lost. I had to raise my hand. Connie said, well, you could stop and ask somebody, but you know it's hard for a man to stop and ask somebody when you know everything anyway. <laughs> hey. <laughs> it don't take long for us to get in the own, own, our own mind, does it? Don't we need the Lord so desperately? The men and the women and the boys and the girls, we need to be prayed. Lord, teach me what? Teach me thy way, O oh Lord, and lead me in a plain path. Let it be so clear that I don't miss it. Amen. Wow. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 8. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place where he should, after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, because he knew where he was going. Is that what the Bible says? How does he go? Did you know that every day, somehow, the Lord's got the helm of this little old ship? And he said, he said, you take off. The, the Lord loves giving us guidance. Come on now. He said, oh! Abraham, I love you because you're just you're living by faith. Wherever you go, I'm gonna I'm gonna the guidance system is gonna be there helping you. Randy was telling me yesterday his little grandson, what was that baby's name? Kason. He, he is so funny anyway, but he got his first bicycle, <laughs> little little Kason, you know, and he's trying to ride that thing was throwing him off. And so he said, well, I'm gonna help you. He said, I'm gonna get you up here on this hill and and let you start, and then when you take off, you won't have to paddle much. You can uh, you can just kind of guide it, balance it going down. Time you get down there, you can go to driving, you can go to pedaling it. Well, he gets him up there, and guess what? It wasn't a real steep one, and so he did. But it, he didn't have to start the bicycle, you know, to have the trouble of starting it. So, man, in a little bit, he's riding the thing all over the place. Yeah, just a little guiding hand. I thought, Lord, put your hand on us. There's not a day we go by, and like the women and the men, we've all we've all been lost. God, help us, help us get to the right spot, Lord. Let us know to turn that thing back there loose. We, we can't guide ourselves. Here's a scripture that we've, we've long time looked at here in Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse number 23. We'll look at two scriptures, 23 and 24. 
Oh, Lord, I know that the way of man is where? He didn't say woman. He said the way of man is not in himself. <laughs> now will you hit me, Shia? <laughs> A little bit. Yeah. <laughs> I know, Lord, that the way of man is not where it's not in himself. Isn't this crazy? When we think that we're going to run the whole world, we, got, we know how to do it. I mean, look what our world is trying to get done. We're going to run this thing. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. It don't matter if you put him in a wheelchair. He still, he still don't know where he's going. We got to have the Lord. And so our business is roll. It's roll, not drift. Roll, I mean, go to work for God. Do everything you can. Pull on those paddles, man. And let, let the Lord have his way in our life. You know, some of the crazy stuff that happens in, in the, this, this may not be... Uh, Meaningful to you, but this where our world is going and the craziness that's in it. One of our, I won't, I won't call his name right now. You may, you may know who it was, but uh, one of the f uh, basketball stars from some years back uh, come, come down with uh, HIV, and so he he makes a. a telecast to the whole world and tells them, he says, I'm going to spend the rest of my life promoting safe sex. Is there safe sin? Does sin have safety? Not in a million years. But that's the ignorance of man. We, we're going to break God's law, but we're going to do it in a way that, it, that we don't get to HIV. Let, let me tell you, you cannot beat God. You can't beat God. The hope that we have is to hear what the Lord says. When he's got his hand on the helm, the, the people live in celibacy until they marry. And when they marry, they stay married till death doeth part. That's God's way. That's whenever his, his hand is on the helm of your vessel. It may not be easy to live with a woman like Connie, but I'm going to stay. I'm staying in there. <laughs> and she's going, <laughs> hey, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a good ride for me, but we, we took a paralyzed oath that whatever happened, we're going to stick it out. And friend, I want to tell you, there is hope in honoring God. Don't throw the towel in. Wherever you come into this race in, it's for the Lord. You set your heart that, Lord, I ain't driving this deal no more. More. I'm leaving it in your hands. I'm going to do the rowing. And Lord, you do the guidance of my life. The book of Judges proves the depravity of mankind without God. They did what was right in their own eyes. And when you see the book of Judges, one wreck right after another, over and over and over, because they would not hear what God has got to say. I love the, the writer in Proverbs chapter 3 and verse number 6. You put your hand into the Lord, look what happens. In all thy ways acknowledge Him. Yeah, it's time to loose those rudder bands and say, Lord, we don't know how to get out of here. We're turning the helm loose. It's in your hands. We're striking sail. We're going to row. You send us where you want us to go. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, this guidance system of the Lord, it brings us a place that you're going to enjoy. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse number 4, the writer says here, and we have confidence in who? We've got confidence in the Lord. Man, if he's our GPS, if he's the guider for us, if he's got his hand on the helm of our vessel, look what's going to happen. We have confidence in the Lord as touching you that ye both do and will do the things which we command you. And the Lord direct your hearts where? Into the love of God. Friends, what's going to happen if you let Jesus guide you? You're going to so fall in love with Jesus, the rest of the world has no meaning. It's not that you don't live here, but this world is not my home. No, I'm just a passing through. Yeah, and my treasures are laid up where? Somewhere beyond the blue. Yeah, and the angels are saying, come on, come on. Don't, don't worry about that stuff down there. We got better and more. Wow, we was reading about that city just recently and that whole city is built of transparent gold. And the streets of the city are transparent gold. Wow, the gates of pearl. You talk about, we've never seen the likes of what's ahead of us if we just stay. Let the Lord guide us. We can't get there without Him, but oh, what are we doing? <laughs> Row and leave the helm. Leave it to Jesus. He's going to guide us right into a love relationship and into this patient waiting. <laughs> 
for Christ. Lord, we just can't wait no longer. Yes, you can. Okay. Okay, Abraham, you can stop here for a little bit. Just set your tent up and, okay, Lord. That's where he stays. Till the, it's time to go now. You better take off into Egypt. You better get out of Egypt. I mean, he, he just guides him around his whole life. Woo! He don't know where he's going, but everywhere the Lord says, this land is your land. <laughs> From California to the New York Island. Yeah. He said, it's yours. Yeah, this is yours. Why? Because it's been given to you by God. Now, <clears throat> The second thought I had in this message, and this is the, uh, yeah, this is one of 20, I guess. <laughs> 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 Not really. <laughs> he said, oh, roll, leave the, leave the helm to Jesus. <clears throat> the significance of Christ's hand on the helm of our life, the significance of it, it'll take eternity to tell that story. Of what happens when we say, God, I can't do it. Hello, Thomas. I can't do it, but God, you can do it. I don't know where to go, but Lord, you know where to go. I don't know how to go, but Lord, you know how to go. So, Lord, I'm just going to start pulling on the oars. And wherever, wherever you send me, I'm going to row. Lord, you do the guide system in my spirit. One of the things that comes out of the significance of Christ hand on the helm of our life is that you'll be surprised what you can live without. As you're rowing along there, some of the stuff is just dropped over the edge and sinks to the bottom. You don't need it no more. In the, in the 19th chapter of the book of Luke, in verse number 8, after a real wild encounter, how many has ever met Jesus in a tree? Me neither, but Zacchaeus did. You remember the song? He was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he, and he climbed up into a sycamore tree, the Savior for to see. And as the Savior came along, he looked up in the tree, and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down, because I'm going to your house for yeah, tea. Yes, I'm going to your house for tea. Well, he said, I'm going to, go, I'm going to your house. I'm going to your house today. Woo! He bailed out of there and said, let's go, Lord, man. Now, this guy, he's a, he's a ruffian. He's a tax collector, and he ain't just a tax collector. He's the chief tax collector. And he's not just a chief tax collector. He is a very rich tax collector. So he's good at what he's doing. He knows how to gather taxes up. And evidently from his own testimony, he knows how to get a little more than what, he really, what was really his. Here he is. He takes Jesus home with him. He is so ecstatic, man. I mean, it's just incredible. They sat down to eat. Evidently from this verse, that's what, that's what it looked like to me. They go home. And then after, after uh, lunch, Zacchaeus stood up. Something has happened in this man's life. For the first time in his life, he done something. He released the helm. His life is all about money. It's all about wealth. It's all about one-upping others when, they, when he's got the authority from the government to do it. He's been doing it. He's very good at what he's doing. He's very rich. And he stands up. And that, here's Jesus sitting at his table. And he stands up and he's got something to say. And what he's saying is, release. There's, you're going to be surprised what you can do without if you follow Jesus. Stuff just drops off. It drops off the side of the boat. You don't need it no more. It's gone. It's forgotten. It's left behind. But you don't care. And look at this man. He gets up. The Bible says, and Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, I mean, something has happened in his life. He's brand new. He, he's, because the Lord told him when he came down that tree, he said, Today salvation is coming. Well, he's speaking to say that to him here in verse number 9. Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. Did you know he didn't care about the poor before? Yeah. <laughs> he didn't give a rip about that. It didn't make no difference to him. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. If I took four, if I took one dollar, I'll put four back in there. Wow. Wow. Does the money matter? No. Over the board it goes. He don't care. No. He's, it's surprising. But look at verse number nine. And here's the glory of that. You'll be surprised what you've been missing. 
Yeah, you may be surprised what you can release, but you'll sure be surprised what you've been missing if you just follow Jesus. You don't have to have a downer or an upper or none. You don't have to live in yesterday's world of trouble. You walk away from that. And look here. And Jesus said unto him, this day is salvation. Come to this house for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. Man, he walks away. And so the joy of knowing I'm forgiven because he was forsaken. Man, the rejoicing of that is brought into his life in the surprise of, hey, that, that's gone, but guess what? I got more than what I paid for. Woo! What money couldn't buy. Now he's an owner of it just because he does this release. Lord, I can't guide my life no more, but I'm willing to let you guide it. Put me back on them oars. Let me pull. Let me do for you, Lord. Whatever. But give me the guidance that I need in my walk. So he passed from death to life. He passed over into peace and hope and joy. You can even smile. When Jesus comes into your life, it's like, man, just row and row and enjoy the guidance system. I know that he's sending me wherever he wants me to go. In Luke chapter 19 and verse number 13, and I'm getting close to closing, and I know you're saying, wow, not 20 more after this, but... In Luke chapter 19, the, he calls 10 of his servants to him, the master does. Evidently, he gives, in this particular version, he gives each one of them one pound or, or one talent. He, he gives to them, and, or, and then he says, Occupy till I come. He didn't tell them what to do with it, he just said, Do. And so that's, put your hands back on the oars. There's no place for us just to be in the boat and doing nothing. We, we got to get a hold and say, okay, we're going to be part of going forward. And my prayer for us as we head into 2021, that God will give us up here, Lord, I don't know what's out there, but I know you know. And so God, guide us around all the storms of time as we begin to pull on these, on these oars and we're going forward. And this word occupy, it's so important because it's just do your work, stay busy till I get back. Well, he hadn't come yet. And so we want, we want uh, Big Springs, Evangelized, and Snyder, and, and, and uh, yeah, Texas, the rest of the world, Lord, whatever it takes to you come. Let us be up and about the master's business until, until we come, until he comes for us. Now, back to Jonah. When, when Jonah started saying what God said, revival broke out. He had three different revivals. In, in Jonah chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, after they throw Jonah out, they're so sad because they know he died. That's their thinking. I don't know if they saw the, the, the whale or the fish swallow him or whatever, but uh, they know that they done his demise. And so they're repentant. And here in Luke chapter, I mean in, in Jonah chapter 1, verse uh, 15 and 16, and they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea. And the sea ceased from her raging instantly. You talk about putting the fear of God on you out there in a storm. It's just about to topple your boat. You've done everything you can. These men were mariners. They knew how to bring the boat around. They could not drive it back to the shore. And they chunked this preacher overboard. And all of a sudden, it's a calm. They, there ain't a drop of air in the sail. And they're going, yikes. <laughs> we're in the hands of God. Look at the next verse. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. So there's revival on the ship. Yeah. When he said, if you throw me out, that'll satisfy God. Friends, that's what the Lord, oh, he's just asking us to turn loose because we're not smart enough to give direction. He's asking us to leave that part alone. And when they said, okay, God, we, 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 they went against the Lord for a little bit. They tried to get him to shore and save him theirself. But God said, you're not going to save him. I'll turn the whole boat over before you do that. He's going, he's going down in the water. The last verse of the first chapter is that the Lord sent a, prepared a fish and he swallowed Jonah. It didn't have to be a big fish. A minnow could have swallowed him. 
Because God is a miracle worker. Yes, he is. Whatever swallowed him, he lived there. But he, he no revival. The first day, all day long, he's still mad. He didn't even go to church on Sunday night, and he sure ain't going Wednesday. But I'm going to tell you, in three days, it soaked on him. He got his soaking. And the third day, it starts out in chapter 2 and verse number 1. Then Jonah prayed. Now, friends, here is another revival. He has caused a revival because he said, all it's going to take. He said, I'm running from God. But if you get me out of this vessel, God's, God, God will save y'all's lives. And so, actually, they, they repent and offer sacrifice and everything. To who? The God, the Lord. L-O, capital L-O-R-D, Lord. I mean, they're serving the God of, jo of Jonah. He said, we ain't seen no God like this. Whoa! Revival in the boat. And now, revival in the fish. It took three days to soak it out of him, but here he comes. He starts praying. Look, look on down in Jonah chapter 2 to verse 7. <clears throat> when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. Oh, friends, I'm just praying as you look ahead and you see what's coming. And you can say, Lord, help me to go back spiritually to Rowan. I don't have no, he has no way out of that, out of that fish's belly except death. He's uh, decomposing while he's in there. My soul fainted within me. I remembered somebody that can help me. Capital L-O-R-D, Lord. The same Lord that was prayed to in chapter 1 by that ship's crew. Now, this old prophet that's running away from God, that's had the helm in his hand, he wouldn't turn it loose for nothing. He's like this. He's free-handed. Lord, okay, I can hear you now. My prayer came in unto thee into the holy temple. Look at the next verse. They that observe lying vanities <laughs> forsake their own mercy. You know what he's saying? I have lied to myself. I said, I ain't going to Nineveh. I don't care what God says. And buddy, you talk about lying vanities and leaving the mercies of God. Look at the cost. Look at verse number 9. But I will sacrifice unto thee the voice of thanksgiving. Lord, if you just somehow could let me out of this fish's belly, I'm going to be thanking you. <laughs> I'm thanking you that you can hear me. And hey, look at these words. I will turn the helm loose. <laughs> you want me to go, Lord? Free hand me. I'm back to rowing again. Send me where you want me to go. I will pay that I have out. Why? Salvation is of the Lord. So, revival in the ship's crew, revival in the whale's belly. And friends, when the Lord turned him out in chapter 3, the scripture says in verse number 1 that the, that the word of the Lord came unto Jonah. The second time. I can see him. Seaweed wrapped around his head. The vomit of that fish on him. He must have. Don't you know he had a bad hair day. That stuff plastered down against his head. But friends, he don't care what they see or say. I mean, he has one place. He has turned the helm plumb loose. And you never see nobody row, row, row their boat like Jonah's rowing his. And friends, you know what happened? The third revival came because he turned. He turned loose in the ship. He turned loose in the, sh in the belly of the, of the well. And he turned loose when he gets to Nineveh and tells them what God said. In chapter 3 of Jonah, in verse number 8, they can hear this screaming prophet. He goes, it's three days journey through there, 60 miles. So they go about 20 miles in and he starts preaching like crazy because he, he wants it to scatter from the center back out to the, the areas of Nineveh. The king, it gets, it gets word to him and he says, let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Turn, turn everything loose. We're going for God, whatever it takes. <clears throat> 
Who can tell if God will turn and repent? Friends, can you believe this wicked man had such understanding? Wow. He, he looks the thing over. And if you read the history of uh, Nineveh, it is one rank city. I mean, they're mean as all oh, get out. And here God looks them over. But who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? What are they doing? Open hands. We're not guiding this thing no more. We're just going to go to rowing. Sackcloth and ashes, praying, calling on God. Don't let the animals eat. Don't let them drink nothing till God, till we hear from what God's got to say. Look at the last verse. And God saw their works. Whew. Now, friends, this message may not mean nothing to you, but I'm just going to tell you this one thing, that God knows what you're doing, and He knows what I'm doing. And He knows if we won't turn loose, and He knows if we will. So what He's saying, if we just got that much understanding to say, God, I can roll, but I can't direct. It's not in me to give myself direction. But I can, I can pull. Just give me, you, you send me. That, that's why there was revival in Nineveh. They turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil and that He had said that He would do unto them. And notice these words. And he did it not. Now he had a basket case on his hand with the fourth chapter, which we won't go into. <laughs> but guess what? The Lord, revival in the boat, revival in the fish, and revival in Nineveh. Because they opened their hand up and said, we can't guide ourselves through this storm. There's no way. We can't fight this. Forty days, we're going to all be dead if we don't turn to God. And I mean, they. Open, I don't know how much longer we've got on this earth, friends. But I will tell you that our hope as a family or as a nation or as a community or as a church, our hope is turn your, turn your hands loose and just work for God until Jesus comes and let Him do the guidance system. Woo! And He's going to guide us right into that harbor of love. Don't you like that? These altars are open this evening. Would you just say, Lord, we're coming with open hands, and we're asking you, Lord, let everywhere we go bring revival. Revival on the boat, revival in the fish's belly. I mean, if we got to have our time with the, come on, revival in Nineveh, Lord, let it break out as we head into 2021. 20, Hallelujah.